questions about uh, phenomic approaches. So hopefully this is uh, clear. And uh, if not, I, I encourage you to email me or ask questions. Um, so what we really wanna talk about today is nature and nurture. I think what you've heard about a lot is nature or genomics. And so nurture would be uh, capturing a lot of the phenomic aspects of plants. So I am a applied maize breeder. And so I think it's always important to say that because every tool that I use and develop has to fit in the context of an applied breeding program um, where we are always short in labor. We're always trying to do too much and have too many projects going on. Um, and so that's a big context of, of where I'm, I'm going with this. Uh, if you look at corn in the United States, uh, of course, the vast majority is in the Midwest. And we just heard from a, a Corteva um, personnel. And that's where a lot of industry is focused on breeding. Uh, let me do the pointer here. Uh, a lot of industry is focused on breeding. Unfortunately, in the South, which is a growing uh, maize growing region, um, we don't really have any industry breeding per se. There are a couple locations in uh, Mississippi, uh, but for the most part, the varieties that are sold in the Southern United States are bred and developed in the Midwest and then and then sent down here. And you can imagine that's that's quite a bit different. So that's part of the reason that we actually have a public corn breeding program. I'm one of the last public corn breeders in the United States. Uh, for the most part, other people are doing corn genetic research, but not actually trying to develop varieties that would be commercialized. And so the black line here just shows the U.S. average yield of maize. The red line shows Texas. And this uh, bump right here is because of the irrigation in the high plains of Texas, which is a high yield environment. And then my target environment is actually this sort of grayish brown line. Uh, and that's that's lowland, um, you know, mostly non-irrigated acres. Uh, and the, the yields are pretty low, much lower than the US average. And so we have developed a lot of uh, unique germplasm, uh, some that's being grown commercially. Most of our germplasm derives from lowland Bolivian and Brazilian germplasm, uh, most of our successful uh, material um, with a lot of simit and other uh, stuff mixed in. Uh, and then we've also got a lot of uh, temperate Midwest that's been crossed to that and been recycled. And aflatoxin and, and corn breeding for whiskey have been some major focuses over the year in traits. But really we're interested in breeding for more than just yield. I know that's really uh, the thing we always talk about is yield, yield, yield. But uh, really uh, at this point, we're talking about farmer profitability. We're talking about human health and nutrition, reduced input use, uh, ecosystem service provision is increasingly a large one. And now climate change resilience. Um, this year we had another record uh, heat wave here in Texas. Uh, I think it was 60 days over 38 Celsius or something like that during the growing season, which uh, you know was very stressful on the plants. So uh, he mentioned briefly perennial corn. I do just like to point out that um, perennial corn is a good mechanism of, of stress resilience uh, potentially because it's evolved to uh, capture growth during the coolest and wettest parts of the year in the spring and the fall. Uh, whereas our commercial corn that we currently plant uh, mainly has to fill its grain during the hottest, most stressful and driest period. Uh, so we can see uh, in some of the wild species, we still have root growth after the normal uh, Zia maize hybrids have senesced and, and, and died. Um, and hybrids are somewhat intermediate to that. But this is a long-term project, probably not a lot of interest uh, to most people in this group, um, but the tools we're developing uh, are able to be applied to uh, these types of questions as well. So I'm hoping Diego uh, showed you guys all this, uh, this breeder's equation. I'm hoping you're very well familiar with it, uh, but it's important to keep in mind that this is really what we're focused on. We wanna make genetic gain over time and we do so by growing more plants, uh, increasing selection intensity and, and selecting plants better, uh, selection accuracy, measuring the plants better. And I'll talk to you about that a lot today. Uh, added a genetic variance. So being able to use more genetic diversity and screen more plots too. And then uh, years per breeding cycle. So to give you an indication in, in my breeding program, and this is from our winter nursery, we grow about 17,000 yield trial plots and about 10,000 nursery plots each year. Uh, of course, the uh, the private sector is much greater than that. They're focused on developing mega varieties to cover uh, the United States, uh, whereas we're sort of targeted this southern uh, United States um, stressful environment. And I also need to mention if, uh, you know, unfortunately, I missed Diego's presentation, the Genomes to Fields project, because we need to be able to use this genetic diversity 
and, uh, and, and leverage what people are doing in other locations. So the Genomes to Fields project will, will come up a little bit in this. In our environment, what we actually do for Genomes to Fields is we grow three uh, environments or three management conditions. We grow an optimal management, we grow a uh, dry land management, so optimal would have irrigation, and then we grow a late planted ir uh, irrigated. And the late planted irrigated is probably the most relevant towards stress tolerance uh, because the plant experiences higher temperatures early on um, and that stress is really uh, uh, unique to see on some of these plants. So the last couple talks uh, really focused on uh, the molecular genetics side. And I just want to remind everybody that, you know, molecular quantitative genomics and statistics uh, really has helped increase uh, the genetic gain equation. So this is just an example from our, um, our uh, magic population. It was a four parent maize population where we compared different mating types, but we also only were able to find a few loci. Uh, unlike what's normally expected with QTL mapping, the, the larger the population, the better your detection ability. We were rather disappointed in the results. And that's part of the impetus for me to start looking for other tools in my breeding program. So there's been three major genomic methodological waves. So in 1986, and I'm assuming many people are familiar with this, QTL linkage mapping came on the scene. And the goal there, of course, is to find loci, to do map-based cloning and find genes, usually using biparental families. But the inference that's been able to make, be made, the, the loci that have been detected there, don't necessarily translate to other populations or other environments. So it's generated a lot of knowledge and publications, but I struggle to point to too much crop improvement uh, that QTL linkage mapping has developed. In 2005, we started to see association mapping, especially in maize. Same goals, but using diverse populations and alleles across population structures, uh, especially when you're doing GWAS in, in hybrids, as we've done. Um, it can be quite powerful to find important loci. But again, for my program, it generated knowledge, publication, but no crop improvement. And so in 2007, uh, we started to see with uh, Bernardo and you and, and other uh, many, Mewison and, and many other folks, uh, genomic selection coming on the scene. And it's important to remember the goal of genomic selection is very different. It's to select the best individual, not to look at loci. We've seen populations varied in this. Uh, we've seen uh, the, the type of training that's been done uh, quite a bit varied. And it's generated a lot of crop improvement and a lot of knowledge, but it hasn't generated so many publications because the, the uh, predictions developed for genomic selection are not necessarily translatable to other environments. Right. And so I'm only framing that in the standpoint of how we're going to talk about phenomics, because people struggle with this concept of, of phenomics. And so I'm hoping that thinking about it in the context of what's gone on in genomics um, will, will help you think about what can go on in phenomics. So the original genome of, of maize uh, by Emerson was mostly used with morphological markers, and it was very sparse. Right. And then uh, in 2005, with the IBM um, population, it was saturated. And we can see how many markers are on the primary chromosome one. Not very many. In 2013, Romay et al. published 681 SNP markers. And then I just found uh, in August of this year, um, a large group published 12.2 uh, million SNPs on 1,500 inbred lines. So I think it's fair to say we've saturated the genome where we have enough markers that we can pretty much predict what every other uh, locus would be, you know, uh, through various methods. And that a lot of that comes through the decre decreased cost in DNA sequencing, as we know, but I don't hear anybody talking about saturating the phenome yet, okay? And so that's the context in which uh, we're gonna really begin getting into uh, phenomics here. So this is a silly example of my family, but you can think about your own family and you probably have relatives. So uh, I have one sister and you can see from this picture that my sister and I look somewhat similar and we both look like our parents. But if you ask somebody why we look similar, they might point to the ha hair color or you know, maybe the eye color, maybe the lip size. Um, but we as humans would struggle with figuring out features that are you know, really identifying how individuals look alike, but we can see that resemblance. We've evolved to see that resemblance. Furthermore, in the context of what I'm gonna talk about later, 
My sister and I look similar later in life, okay? So we still have uh, facial features that look similar, but we're different here than we were earlier in life. So our facial features are the combination of nature, right? Genetics, plus the environment, G by E, and then, you know, management. So we know people, for instance, who grow up in war zones or malnourished. Um, the two siblings will look similar, but they might be a foot shorter than if they were, um, you know, well-fed. Okay, so that's a context I hope everybody can, uh, can think about. We also know that uh, individuals that are related in this way perform similarly, you know, have similar intelligence levels, maybe similar athletic abilities. Uh, so there's a lot of correlation there. And my, my posture here is that uh, this phenomics approach of capturing these appearances, which would incorporate environment G by E and management better, is more predictive of performance than genetics alone. Recently, I was talking to a prospective graduate student, uh, Masambola, uh, who made me aware of uh, his work and some other work, looking at facial features in goats, is what he did. Um, but there's a group that's shown heritability in facial features uh, through a GWAS analysis uh, in the Han Chinese. There's another group that's looked at deep face models and where various features uh, are corresponding to gender or age, right? So, so wrinkles tend to show up around the mouth, for instance. So we know that we have facial features that could be used in uh, somehow looking at relatedness or, or phenotyping, okay? So this is gonna really correspond to the end of my talk, but I want people to be able to think about, um, you know, how we would measure more features uh, in humans or plants. So let's jump into high throughput field phenotyping. Um, so what most people so far, unfortunately, think of high throughput field phenotyping as is a way to automate routine measurements. So, you know, we measure plant height with a yardstick. Can we measure it with a drone or a vehicle, right? Or we can measure grain yield in sorghum and wheat where the panicle is up. You can actually count the, uh, the grain and estimate grain yield or disease. Uh, and I'll show you examples of the things in green here. But what I'm really interested in is finding new signatures of leapness. So temporal growth patterns, like I showed you how my sister and I look similar, but at two different points, that's a richer feature of data set, right? It's how we interacted with our environment over the years. Uh, senescence and grain filling period I'm gonna talk about. And ultimately that'll lead me to phenomic selection, which I think is probably gonna be the most game-changing technology in plant breeding uh, you know, in, in decades. Now, what's really interesting here is all these things that we discover as being useful uh, can also help farmers in stress signature management. And I'll show you that example uh, in the estimating disease. It'll also help us identify new phenotypes and mechanisms of biological importance that could be used in something like uh, gene editing, if you're interested in that. Uh, and I'll show you an example of that as well. I'm not gonna spend time talking about the process of going from uh, UAS or drone or whatever you wanna call it data um, to making useful decisions, uh, but this has taken a number of collaborators and my group, uh, we've been working on this for seven years now, uh, so that it's, it's much more routine. And the people here deserve a lot of credit. Uh, there's a couple others I'm not showing and, and Reagan made this slide, just showing the whole pipeline and workflow of flying the UAV, which is actually probably the easiest part, and downloading the images to the ortho mosaicing process, developing shape files, uh, the FAC4 process, masking soil, extracting vegetation indices. And of this whole workflow, the only thing I personally, as Seth Murray, know how to do uh, is uh, about here in the analyzing data part. The rest of this has all been my, my awesome students and colleagues. Looks like, there we go. Um, but there's still problems with uh, these tools. So uh, this is an example from Aaron. You know, you still get hot spots, uh, this bright spot here, or distortions. And, you know, collecting the data is still not a, a perfect process. It's akin to uh, trace files when we were doing SSR genotyping back in the early 2000s. For anyone who is using UAS tools, I do like to point out that uh, Steven Anderson and I wrote a R package uh, to make these shape files, when you start to deal with thousands of plots in your breeding program and you need to extract information from each plot individually, uh, you really need a tool that can help you draw those plot boundaries. And so you, in this, all you need is your breeder's field book and two field coordinates, and you can get the shape file to extract features from everything.
So I'm gonna go way back to our very first publications in this area, uh, plant height, just cause I think it's nice to show um, how plants grow over time. So on the Y axis here is um, the days after planting. Actually, these are calendar days, I believe. Calendar days uh, in, the, in the year. And this is showing two different drones, a tough wing UAV ma mapper and a copter. And this is just plant height in those three genomes to fields trials I mentioned, the late planting, uh, the optimal planting and the dry land planting. And these different lines are different genotypes. So what's unique about some of these lines is there are a few crossover effects, meaning the information that you find early in the season is not necessarily uh, predictive of what you'll find later in the season. And so that means we have additional uh, SNPs or features we could use in our phenomic prediction models. I'll point out that, uh, that in this case, um, we actually had better correlation to grain yield with the drone data than we did with the manual data. So this idea of using the manual data with a yardstick as a reference for measuring our plants is probably pretty antiquated. The, the drones are probably gonna do a better job. I wanna have some connection to genomics here. So I'll just show you this one study that was published uh, a few years ago uh, by Stephen. And what he did was use those plant height models to estimate the plant height in uh, QTL linkage mapping populations on every day of growth. And what was interesting is we map QTL and we see that some QTL actually happen early in the season and then basically would be non-detectable by the later part of the season. So if we're really trying to get to uh, the biology of the plant or where we can make the most progress, you know, we tend to measure plant height at the end of the season and we're missing out on all this important uh, information that's segregating and we can select on earlier on in growth. So let me tie these two things together and start talking about vegetation indices. Uh, so Natalia Cruzado is a, is a Brazilian. She was a, a PhD student with me. She's currently working for Corteva. Um, but she was looking at NGRDI after uh, in, a, in a population, uh, I believe this is genomes to fields. And there are three commercial hybrids here that are completely unrelated to our knowledge. They're from three different companies, so we expect they're unrelated. And then we have four half-sib hybrids, all with a common parent of TX714. And what we can see is the overall vegetation index is more similar for these half-sibs than it is for these unrelated commercial checks. So if we think about what that means, that's much like what I was showing with human faces, where relatives that are more similar are gonna show features that are more similar, and it's our job to start measuring them and, and developing a rich data set. So I'll jump to uh, rust and senescence, and this is a little bit more of a story, and this is part of Alan, uh, Aaron DeSalvo's PhD uh, project, and this has been published in scientific reports. So we were looking at southern rust and senescence uh, using high throughput phen field phenotyping. So Southern rust is a problem here in Texas, and uh, we could go out in the field. Uh, I, as a breeder, have gone out to the field to rate hybrids, uh, but it's really laborious and it changes from day to day. So I don't know if I got the best day when I go out and screen that population. And furthermore, it's sort of somewhat subjective. I'm kind of guessing. And so what Aaron did was he actually developed this rating scale and rated uh, UAS or drone imagery. And the idea there is that, first of all, we can develop an algorithm to predict this. And uh, second of all, that's the training data set that, uh, that can be used for you know, AI approaches later or machine learning approaches later. The benefit here from a farmer perspective is, well, maybe we can catch this earlier and be able to apply a fungicide treatment. So this is just a little bit of a, of a cartoon here um, showing uh, two years, 2020 and 2021, and the various dates that the drone was flown. My program tries to optimize collecting the most drone data throughout the year. We don't target any specific trait. And that's what's really allowed us to develop phenomic selection methodology and, and other calibrations that were never pre-planned in the experiment. So we know the plants grow, they flower, they set seed and they senesce, right? Um, and then something like Southern rust, it uh, hastens their senescence. And we can see from false color images uh, using some vegetation indices uh, that it's very clear that like this plot has senesced here, whereas this one is still nice and green, okay? So we can see that with our eye. How do we get the computer 
to actually do the uh, to actually identify that. Now we could use an AI approach, but it may not be interpretable. It may not be uh, uh, able to be ported over to other populations or other environments. And so we mainly just focused on the vegetation indices here. So I think I already told you this, uh, 13 flights, 17 flights, senescence scores. Uh, Dr. Scott Wild was one of the people who, who flew and Aaron flew in 2022 along with Reagan. Okay, so here's an example of some of the vegetation indices. And I think now for multispectral, we extract about 86 vegetation indices for uh, for regular RGB cameras, we're extracting about 20, 30, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, and so each one of these is a different vegetation index. So that's the blue channel by itself. And then here's excess green, for instance, which is fairly predictive. Uh, BCC is a, is a really predictive one that we see. NGRDI is a common one. And we can see these different patterns. And across the two years, the patterns don't necessarily line up. So in a phenomic prediction model, and this isn't the true phenomic prediction, uh, this is sort of just simple cross-validation. I probably should, should change the title here. Uh, we're using a training data set and then a test data set uh, to look at predicting senescence from these vegetation index scores and uh, predicting rust from these vegetation index scores. And so what we see, first of all, is that these uh, vegetation indices are heritable. So the temporal repeatability or you know, essentially heritability um, is bouncing right around here between 25 and 50% for each one of these vegetation indices on the Y axis. We break this down into a, a model of flight because obviously when you're flying at seedling, it's very different than when you're flying at uh, flowering and very different when you're flying at senescence. Pedigree explains only a small amount of information, but that's only because flight so overwhelms the amount of pedigree information here. We fit some spatial models as well, range and row or row column variation, a rep, and then we have a residual. So the first thing to, to really note about these vegetation indices is that they are highly correlated between each other, but within a growth stage. So uh, in this example, we've uh, laid out all of the vegetation indices together by date. So this is flying in seedling at this end, and this is flying mature plants at this end. Uh, what we can see here is probably the vegetative to adult plant um, transition. Uh, and then the other uh, thing to note is that it's, it's very different uh, between years too. We see these vegetation indice correlations uh, quite different between years. I do need to point out, because we've had a lot of criticism of our phenomic methods, uh, that there's a lot of multicollinearity. And so Alper, uh, and he asked me to put baby doctor, he's our newest PhD in the program. So, uh, so he's going by baby doctor these days. Um, if we look at these various uh, dates, and here's multispectral phenomic data from 2018 dry land, from 2018 irrigated, from 2017, from 2018 dry land, from 2018 irrigated. And then here's genomic data. What we can see is that the genomic data actually probably has higher multicollinearity than our vegetation index uh, temporal approach. Um, and so for people who are, who are critical of this, uh, this is one, one thing we can present. And then the other is that we use uh, machine learning methods so that multicollinearity is, is reduced as a problem. To go back to rust, um, the, the heritability of, of uh, Southern rust was very high, uh, you know, again, mostly genetic uh, with range row variation, rep, and some residual. Senescence, uh, we actually looked at on a temporal uh, scale and time is again, the biggest uh, variance component of, of that with a lot of genetic uh, variation. But the repeatability of, of senescence was 0.6 to 0.9. Variable importance scores is another way to look at this. And so in this case, uh, RCC, which is a vegetation index uh, for um, senescence at 112 days in 2020, predicted uh, the best in early growth. So what this suggests, although it could be an artifact, and that's what subsequent validation studies are needed for, that we can predict the senescence of some of the plants. Uh, this is not perfect correlation, but this is a high correlation. We can predict the time a plant will senesce 
based on early season growth. So that's part of the power of phenomics is uh, if we measure enough things, we eventually will saturate the phenome and we'll be able to predict things uh, that we never intended to previously. The really exciting part for me and what's really catalyzed Alper and Aaron's future work uh, was this figure here. So on the bottom uh, of this figure is yield. And what we can see is plant height, which we know is co highly correlated to yield, is correlated to yield. But we were really surprised to see that senescence was correlated to yield. And then the difference between senescence and flowering time, which we call grain filling, was very highly correlated to yield. So this phenomic measure of senescence that Aaron uh, did by visual observation and then uh, developed the calibration using vegetation index indices um, is predictive of yield in our segregating populations. So using uh, various machine learning approaches, they've now been able to figure out, you know, rust, um, for instance, has an accuracy of about 0.75 uh, and uh, that's in that's in CV1 and in CV2, you know, it's a little bit lower. So the linear model in this case, once we get into something like CV2, CV3, CV4, uh, performs quite poorly, and that's probably largely because of that multicollinearity problem. Now Alper's taken that a little bit further and uh, started modeling senescence using those those scores. And so this is an example for anybody who may not be following me here um, with two genotypes, genotype A and genotype B, the date that the plants silk to the date that his uh, remote sensing, his UAV senescence measure is taken is what we call the grain filling period. And so we can have two genotypes with dramatically different grain filling periods. And so when we talk about plant stress, the grain filling period is one of the biggest indicators of what can survive through plant stress. Because if you flower and then you're able to fill the grain for a very long time, your yield is typically going to be much higher than if you flower and, and as soon as drought comes in, uh, you senesce. So the grain filling period and modeling that is, is quite important. He's found, uh, excitingly, that the grain filling period uh, is very predictive of yield, especially between environments. And so this is something that you don't necessarily have captured with a genomic model. So in this case, you see the late planted uh, plants, which are much taller, and so you would think would yield higher, uh, but their grain filling period is much shorter than something that was planted in an optimal env environment. And that's really what's, what, what's helping us figure out that this grain fill filling period can be measured by remote sensing uh, and is predictive of, of grain yield. And then just one last uh, comment on this. Um, Alper has really continued to expand the modeling aspect of this. Uh, now he has pedigree flight management, pedigree by management, pedigree by flight, flight by management, pedigree by flight by management, and then uh, row column and, and rep. And so these more complicated models are really going to help us get at the main effects that are genetic and our environmental and our management. I told you before about being able to product predict uh, rust and senescence early in, in plant growth. Um, this is a, pub, a paper that he published when he was a PhD student in remote sensing. And this just knocked my socks off. This is when I think I was completely sold on, on UAS drone measurements. So we have here on the x-axis, uh, very I'm sorry, on the y-axis, various vegetation indices. And then on the uh, x-axis here, we have uh, the day after planting. And what actually blew me away was that the highest prediction for yield came early on in the season. So it came before the plants actually flowered. And our hypothesis on this is that everything after flowering has already been selected for by breeders for a very long time because it's been measured. Most breeders listen to physiologists who say the important part of, grain, uh, of, of yield is flowering to grain fill and it's that grain filling period. But oftentimes we don't even go to the field to look at the plants early on. And so by flying drones at this point, we can actually identify segregating variation we can select for that will increase end terminal yield. And that was really exciting. I think the last major component here I'm gonna talk about is phenomic selection. And so to understand phenomic selection, you need to understand a little bit about near infrared spectroscopy for those people who may not be familiar. So near infrared spectroscopy, uh, our thermo Fisher Antares 
is measuring something like uh, 3,000 wavelengths being reflected from corn kernels. We then take and grind those and we send them for chemical analysis. And we take that spectra and we use the partial least squares calibration to make something predictive for starch, oil, protein, et cetera. So this has been done for 30 years where you would use near infrared light to augment your wet chemistry data or your, or your actual measurements and develop predictive equations. So we've applied that to our breeding and genetics research. And we found that uh, we found that the calibrations for crude protein look great compared to phosphorus, but that the genetic um, variation actually is about similar between these two. So that led us to an idea that, well, maybe it's not just the accuracy of the measurement, maybe it's also the number of measurements you're taking. And we found that uh, that's true. Um, this is a recently published study by my former student, Holly Lane, uh, where she showed high throughput uh, phenotyping can actually produce better decisions than high accuracy phenotyping in plant populations. So just a little side there. So phenomic selection uh, was initially uh, had, was initially published by Rinson et al. in 2018, and it was probably the best paper I've read in my career, or most exciting. Um, in this paper, they used near infrared spectroscopy that I just showed you, but instead of trying to predict uh, composition based on certain absorbance wavelengths, uh, they actually used it like genomic selection. What they found was the phenomic selection models in both wheat and popular was as accurate as genomic selection, but it was cheaper. And so we had a similar data set from dry land and irrigated trials. We had about 4,000 samples we'd skinned into NIR. And then Holly Lane, along with uh, Jose Crosa and his team, uh, looked at this data and saw, can we use this in phenomic uh, prediction and phenomic selection? And again, the results were extremely promising. Um, we found a whole high correlation for yield, uh, and part of that was due to the protein, starch, and oil correlations with yield. One of the things I found really exciting about this that you don't necessarily see with genomic selection was that the calibrations we developed in one population and in one environment actually were predictive uh, in, another, um, in another environment and in totally unrelated populations. Okay? So that led to a question, are predictions based on composition like the protein or are they based on relatedness like genomic selection is? And I'm pretty confident now the answer is both. And that's why phenomic selection can outperform genomic selection. Okay, there we go. So I think this is one of my, one of my last slides here. And, and this is the, uh, the, the crux of where my program is going and where I think the best opportunities are for breeding for stress uh, environments is in uh, phenomic prediction or phenomic selection. Um, Alper submitted this to uh, G3. It's conditionally accepted uh, a little while ago, but you can access it from my archive if you're interested. In this case, he did all, C all, all the uh, CV measurements using genomic prediction, multispectral prediction, and RGB prediction. And what he found was for CV2, which is one of the more uh, important ones, right? Uh, predicting untested genotypes in tested environments. So how would untested genotypes perform in a new, uh, or in, in an environment that we've measured? Uh, it did outperform uh, genomic prediction. When it came to CV3, tested genotypes in untested environments, maybe not so much, uh, but untested genotypes in untested environments um, we see that phenomic prediction uh, is about equivalent to genomic prediction, okay? And in this case, he had uh, 1,068 phenomic features, 89 vegetation indices by 12 time points, 525 uh, phenomic features for the RGB, 35 vegetation indices by 15 time points. And for genomic prediction, he was using about 153,000 markers. So he's expanded on this into other populations now. I don't have those results to show you today. Uh, but phenomic prediction continues to look very promising. So I think I'll leave you with this. You know, what do I believe the future in plant breeding looks like, especially for stress environments, is we're measuring certain dependent traits of interest, yield, nutrition, ecosystem service provision, um, whatever you'd like. We have some certain physiological measures we take and we think is important, like flowering or plant height. We have temporal phenomic measures that we measure from drone. So plant height at 30 days, plant height at 60 days, plant height at 90 days. We're going to have some segregating remote sensing measures, and that's most of what I showed you. 
And then we may still re uh, retain some genomic measures, but we're, we're finding oftentimes they're redundant to our phenomic uh, information. From all this, we can incorporate weather models, uh, develop relationship matrices, and develop uh, statistical analysis that are predictive uh, of untested hybrids for untested environments. So with that, I'll end. Hopefully I, I didn't speak too quickly and um, I don't normally present in this order. So hopefully it was somewhat coherent for you. I look forward to any questions and any discussion that may come for this and thanks for your time.